Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot and thank you for joining me for part three of four on my exploration into the numerology of tarot, um, specifically focusing on the pip cards, the one through ten, but also their relationship to the trump cards as well. Um, there is a further and more detailed explanation of what we're doing in my original video on the aces um, that has a longer introduction. So if you're a little lost about what we're trying to do here, uh, go back and watch that video. All right, so we left off with the fours and our stability, and then along comes the number five and kind of busts everything up and makes a mess of everything. Now, my primary keyword for the numbered cards um, in the suits is disruption for this one. But it's a little hard to reconcile that with the image of the Hierophant. And I'm not sure I, I fully can do that, but let me sort of talk around that and maybe we'll get there. So the Hierophant, of course, or the Pope, as um, the older cards show them, you know, is this figure blessing two acolytes or two monks or whoever they are. And he, of course, is a man with a plan, right? He, you know, he's the, the figurehead of the church, he represents sort of God's word on earth, and he is a guide or a teacher. And so I see him uh, in a positive sense as someone who can lead us through this disruption. That's kind of my, my um, nod to how this all fits together. So we're experiencing some, some difficulty in our life, some disruption, some um, unexpected circumstances, whatever it might be, and then we can turn to our spiritual tradition, hopefully if it's a positive one and supportive one in the ways that we need to help us get through all of this. Um, of course, um, historically, the, the, the Pope and the Catholic Church were colonial um, entities and so um, created a lot of strife and disruption and poverty um, and even genocide themselves. So again, you do see a connection there, um, unfortunately. And taken um, in a poor light in the modern context, you could get someone who is you know, a religiously corrupted leader. I'm thinking about um, certain scandals and things even in modern times with mega churches being led by child molesters and things like that. So that's the that's the perverted quality of the Hierophant. And I'll just go ahead and turn this over because it seems apropos. So then you have the devil as the parallel of, uh, of the Hierophant in the RWS with card number 15. I think in a positive light, uh, going back to that that way of looking at it, the Hierophant blesses us and encourages us and provides guidance and support where we need it. In the shadow side, they could be a proselytizer, they could be a false prophet, they could be you know, a cult leader, something like that. Someone who's trying to trick us or feed into our sense of ego in order to get us to donate money um, to their cause, for example, something like that. Um, they could also be a harsh judge of our behavior, so they could excommunicate us or damn us or something like that. In terms of these cards and then their relationship to the Golden Dawn keywords um, in the pips, we have strife for the wands, loss in pleasure for the cups, defeat for the swords, and material trouble for the pentacles. Now here's an instance where the Golden Dawn keywords actually have a unified theme, difficulty. Uh, struggle, defeat, loss, trouble. So while I'm uh, always a little concerned or interested uh, when a five turns up in a reading, at least I know that it's consistent and that the imagery is going to be consistent here. Now, what do we do with this kind of overwhelmingly negative imagery in a reading? Because um, I do like to approach the cards from a very neutral perspective, right? They could be neutral, positive, or negative, depending on the scenario. So how can you look at these um, cards and come up with meaning that applies? Let's say, you know, let's say you did a spread and you laid these out and then you had like, what's the best possible outcome? And you got one of these cards. <laughs> how do you reconcile that? You have to have a way. Otherwise, the reading's not going to make any sense and you're going to go away feeling, you know, like you didn't get a good read on the situation or your client's going to be pissed off and say well they're a shitty tarot reader you know they told me the best possible outcome is i'm going to lose my house and get kicked out and have to live on the street so that doesn't work so 
Um, again, going back to this idea of change and disruption, you know, most of us don't like change, um, especially if we're in, in, you know, decent circumstances or have any kind of privilege at all. Um, we want things to kind of stay familiar, even if they're not the best they could be. We want things to kind of stay familiar and nice. So when we get broken out of that stability and that conservatism of the four, it can be very uncomfortable. And this is kind of what it can look like. This is what it can kind of feel like, even if the change isn't that bad or even if the change ultimately is positive, but it shakes us up in the process. Strife is interesting for the Five of Wands. I typically read this card as people not working well together, and that can be because of, you know, pettiness or conflict of personalities, but can also be because we're all working clumsily towards the same goal. So we, we want to work well together. We want to support each other, but we're just not doing a very good job. Um, maybe there's a breakdown in communication and, you know, uh, oh, I was going to do that. No, I already did it. You know, this is what really needs to be done, but nobody's doing that part of it, um, that kind of thing. So it's like a clumsier version of the Three of Pentacles where, you know, you're working on a group project, but things aren't going so great. The loss and pleasure uh, of the Five of Cups, you know, this is often called the grief card, and certainly it, it gives that, um, that kind of image of, a, of, of someone, you know, sad with their head down, looking away, uh, moping or, or pining or whatever. But again, it's more about the perception of what is happening rather than what is really happening. Um, so you get, you know, often people focus on this down here. It's like, well, you, you tipped over three cups, but you still have two, you know, all is not lost. And I see this as, you know, being forced out of your emotional comfort zone. Um, maybe there's self-soothing activities um, that you like to do that are not healthy for you. So you need to look at that and break out of it. Um, and it feels very uncomfortable to do that. I know I've been having to do that for the last year very intensively and it kind of sucks and it makes you feel like this, but it's better for you in the long run. In the long run, it makes you more emotionally stable. Um, same thing here, defeat, you know, if you were in a conflict with someone, if you were arguing with them, or maybe you got the last word in, but then you felt like shit afterwards, right? Like I got the last laugh, but I, it was against someone I care about. And now I feel like an asshole because I just chewed them out. And even though, you know, logically, whatever, it made sense, um, emotionally, it felt like crap. Or, you know, same thing. Maybe somebody confronted you about some problematic behavior that you were doing and you feel like crap afterwards, even though with time, um, that disruption will reveal itself as a blessing. And then for the material trouble, you know, this one's a little bit harder because, of course, the economic situation across the globe is very unfair and not equitable. And so there are people who are genuinely without the basic needs met and goods and services to survive. And so I don't want to sort of wave that away. But at the same time, most of the people that I encounter in my life, uh, most of the people that I know are not in that circumstance. And so if I'm reading for them, I don't, I don't interpret this card as, oh, you're going to lose your house um, or, you know, you're going to suddenly get leprosy and die or something like that. But I do see this as more of like poverty mindset or worry about money troubles or worry about my house falling apart, that kind of thing. So I, it's kind of a blend of the mental and the physical. It's kind of um, maybe freaking out about the hot water heater when ultimately, you know, it's just going to be an expense and you'll eventually deal with the hot water heater and you'll have hot water again, even if it takes two weeks, weeks to get it replaced and it's an inconvenience, right? It's like, it's a disruption and it sucks but it's temporary. And maybe by getting the new hot water heater, you'll save on your energy bill because the old one used a lot of energy and this one uses less or something. So, so it's that kind of disruptive thing that happens in your life that you grow through, either because it did suck and it was bad and the whole thing was negative from start to finish, but hey, you got through it, or because in the end, in the final summation, you learned something about yourself or you um, maybe bolstered your relationship with that person that you had an argument with, even though you had to go through the fight to kind of get there. So um, it, it's a tricky, it's a tricky one, the number five. Um, but, you know, I think it's very interesting and dynamic. 
Um, the last thing I'll say about the five is that I did try to study Kabbalistic numerology, and a lot of it never really stuck. It sort of had its own internal logic, and I and I respect it for that. But the five was interesting, and I can't remember what the the Jewish term for it is, so I apologize. Um, but the the takeaway sort of key phrase I got from it was someone withholding information that you're not ready to receive, which is fascinating for me personally. Um, I'm just going to go to my FaceTime camera before I go back in there. So let me just do a sidebar here. Okay, so I'm studying Buddhism. Buddhism is a received tradition, like Kabbalah, actually. You have to have an authorized teacher teaching you. You know, you can read about Buddhism in Buddhism books and on Buddhism websites and by listening to recordings of Buddhist teachers talking. You can, you can sort of like glean bits and pieces, but you're not considered a Buddhist unless you have a teacher. And in that received tradition, your teacher will organize sort of a curriculum in a way, um, but they will give you information as they feel you are ready for it. They're not going to tell you everything all at once because it's a ton of information and you have to do the groundwork. You have to put in the time to study and practice on your own and refine and change your you know, change your default processes and things and your, your habitual mental thinking before you're going to be open and ready to receive the next bit of information, the next hardest, you know, thing that you have to do in the teachings. And that really resonated me with me um, when I heard what the Kabbalistic, you know, numerological association with five was. It's sort of a test. It's a trial. It's um, It's not meant to be you know, a game where you have to follow the rules and it's, you know, it's all secret and you don't know if you succeeded or not and you get judged harshly at the end. It's not about that. It's really about, you know, is this person ready for the next step, which is going to be difficult? Have they done the groundwork? Have they done their homework? Have they progressed enough up to this point that they're ready for the next bit of information? And if not, I'm going to tell them they're not ready and they need to go back and do some more of this other stuff. Um, and that can also feel harsh. It can feel like you're being judged. It can feel like you're a failure, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So the fives have kind of a special resonance for me on that level too, on kind of a spiritual level is, you know, are you ready to progress? Are you ready um, to face facts about uh, your shortcomings in a particular area and then actually do the work and work on them? All right, so we'll look at some uh, comparative cards again, as we have been. And I want to start with Let's just start with the Five of Pentacles, um, since we were talking about spirituality here. This is an interesting one. It's it's somewhat similar. So you have this person, and I don't know if you can really see, but they have sort of um, earth-toned, you know, clothes on, very plain clothes, as opposed to some of the other characters in the deck that have like bright and beautiful embroidered clothing on. So I think, and they're barefoot. So I think the implication here is that they're, you know, there may be um, they may be without means at this point in their life. But what I like about this is this this um, little hut here is very accessible. There's a door. It's warm and cozy. So it's about whether or not you're going to go into that space. Um, and I almost see this person as a pilgrim in this particular setting, that they're actually depriving themselves on purpose in order to kind of concentrate their understanding or to cut out the distraction of being too comfortable if that makes sense. Um, so that's an interesting, you know, kind of ter interpretation of the five. Here we have, again, this idea of working with at cross purposes in this is the fifth spirit tarot. So here we have five different kinds of implements and a hornet's nest in a tree. Um, and I can just imagine, you know, like five people all picking a different implement and saying, no, we should we should set it on fire. We should stab it with a fork. We should beat it out with a baseball bat. You know, here's how we're going to do. And what they ended up doing was maybe all injuring themselves and each other rather than actually getting rid of the hornets, which weren't causing any harm in the first place and probably should have just been left alone. Um, you know, so this is kind of like making a mountain out of a mole, molehill thing. Here in the Five of Pentacles for the Fifth Spirit, um, I really like this one because to me this is a very positive card. This looks like a cairn that would have been erected to pay homage or pay tribute to ancestors or to particular deities perhaps. And then we have a fresh loaf of bread here that's been left as an offering. So it's, it's the idea of giving up in order to sustain. It's the idea of maybe fasting 
or again, kind of depriving yourself intentionally of something in order to practice gratitude, in order to um, sharpen your awareness of how much you do get to receive um, and that kind of thing. And then here we have one final example of the fives from the guy in tarot. So um, on the right here, we have a figure inside of a kind of an earthen burrow that he, uh, he has built for himself. So, you know, he's he is outside in the forest and he's not in a building, maybe still a bit cold, but he does have shelter. You know, he's managed to make shelter out of the earth, out of the, the things that are uh, physically available to him. Um, and then here we have um, the five of water, which would correspond with this. So the, the colors in this card are very subdued. We have a very overcast kind of gray sky. Um, this looks like it's autumn or winter, wherever uh, the scene might be set. And her hair's wet. So I'm imagining that she's actually taken this boat here, maybe gone for a swim and is now on the shore. And I like to imagine that this is like a nourishing bowl of tea or soup or something that she's, you know, made over a campfire um, and is, is warming up after her swim. So again, you know, the, the cold water plunge, the, um, you know, that kind of a thing, the, the purification of going through a trial, um, but also just the fact that she's, you know, maybe she's grieving, maybe she's not, uh, maybe she's just contemplating, um, you know, it could be as simple as that. So uh, I like the more neutral um, version of this card versus the uh, RWS and you know, it helps me think about the fives, uh, especially for the emotional state in a little bit different way. All right, on to the sixes. So after the disruption of the five, we need a reset. We need some help. And the lovers comes in as our number six card. So for the lovers uh, trump itself, um, I typically read this as a partnership, a contract, equanimity, fidelity, commitment, and then in the in the negative aspect, it can be attachment or codependency. So relying too heavily on a partner. Generally, uh, view sixes is fairly positive. Although we can look at the corresponding card uh, in the sixteen, which would be the tower, um, which is often viewed as a very negative card. So you know it's an interesting card to kind of balance out um, the lovers. And I. It didn't occur to me until this morning, actually, when I was getting ready to shoot this, but, you know, this is the breakup, right? This is getting together, and that's literally breaking up. Like, your whole thing's on fire, everybody gets thrown to the ground, nobody feels good about it. <laughs> Tom Benjamin sometimes reads the tower as orgasm, which is also another interesting um, thing to think about in the context of a uh, sexual partnership. Um, so certainly there are positive and, and negative aspects to, to both of these cards. And then if we look down here in um, how these play out in the sixes of the four suits, uh, they, they fairly well work with the Golden Dawn keywords, I would say. Certainly the Golden Dawn keywords are very much reflected in the images themselves. Um, so you have victory, pleasure, earned success for the Six of Swords, which is kind of weird. Um, that to me does not go with the picture, um, but material success does. It's um, for the Pentacles, it's you know having enough money that you can then donate to charity. Um, and yes, this is very like patriarchal view of what charity means. Like I'm, I'm the 1% and you're the bottom 1% <laughs> kind of thing here. So it's not, it's not equal in that sense. Um, but you know, you get the point that this person has more and they're sharing. Uh, another kind of aspect of sixes for me personally, um, is in thinking about another Buddhist concept called the six paramitas or the six perfections. And those, uh, the way that I have learned them in my own, you know, for my own tradition is generosity, discipline, or conduct, how you conduct yourself, patience, diligence, concentration, and wisdom. And those are certainly things that you need to have in any positive relationship, uh, right? You need to have generosity. You need to be kind to yourself in the relationship and also to the other party. You need to conduct yourself very well and consistently. You need to show up for them and um, they need to be able to rely on you, whether that's a business partner or a romantic partner or a member of your family, whatever it is. Um, you need to have patience. Um, you need to, again, have that, that, dil that diligence to keep putting in the work and keep feeding the relationship to make it a healthy one. Uh, the partnership doesn't end the day after you get married, um, like, it, like it does in rom-coms, right? It, it goes on and on. And um, if you've made that kind of monogamous uh, commitment to someone, it goes on and on and on and on. And, you know, how do you, how do you continue to be diligent and committed to someone when you both are changing throughout 
years and years together. And then uh, concentration and wisdom. So again, paying attention to the details, making sure that you don't start taking someone for granted just because they happen to be there all the time um, or just because they've always done that thing for you, um, that they're always going to be doing it for you that kind of thing. And then, you know, just using all five of those experiences to to have wisdom and to apply that wisdom when things come up because inevitably they will. So I, I like that for these for these sixes. And I can I can read that into these cards. Now in looking at numerology, we can also talk about double growth for the sixes. You know, right? Three plus three is six. I also see this in in the pictures of the cards as giving and receiving, asking for help, and growing personally through helping others. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. So here we have, you know, our triumphant figure on a horse with a wreath, and then we have some other folks here next to him. And I think of this as celebrating someone. So vicarious joy, being happy for somebody who's had a success rather than being sort of jealous of them or feeling petulant or feeling like, oh, that should have been me or whatever. Just being happy. You know, your friend says, I got a promotion. And the first thing that you think about and that you say is, that's great. You deserve it. I'm so proud of your hard work instead of, well, I'm not going to get a promotion or my boss hates me or whatever like whatever petty thing might come to mind. Here we have pleasure. And, you know, a lot of people, I think just because it happens to be two children, I think that's how this got started. But a lot of people read this as nostalgia. It's never made any sense to me. What I see this is one person giving a flower to another person, right? Giving and receiving. So providing pleasure, providing emotional support, paying someone a compliment, you know, that kind of thing. If we're in the realm of emotions with cups, so then you're helping somebody to feel good. You know, you're soothing them, you're bolstering them, you're telling them how happy you are in the relationship with them, how much you value their friendship. Here we have two figures, an adult and a child, presumably, on a boat, and someone else is propelling them in a new direction. And so, um, you know, while earned success doesn't make a lot of sense to me, um, I can make the picture make sense by thinking about this person helping these people, right? So they need to get somewhere, maybe they're fleeing some kind of bad situation, and then this person is the means by which they can get there. And then again, you know, our reciprocity um, or, you know, charitable giving kind of situation over here, I have, I have so much that I will now share with you. And I also see these uh, see this kind of concept here reflected not just in one-on-one -on -one relationships, but in community relationships and building community strong, strongly, um, building it up together. So again, that sense of cooperation. If you take the the threes um, and cooperation, so if you double that, then you're really getting a larger group of people together involved in some kind of community project or mutual aid society or you know whatever that is. So we can look at some examples from other decks. So here we have, you know, this is the Six of Swords, right? You still have two people walking down this thing towards this doorway. So it's this kind of moving along. Typically, if we like the RWS image, then we want to see some kind of like portal or journey or travel, something like that happening in the Six of Swords. We don't have a vehicle here, but we do have these two people walking through this doorway, and, and one has their hand kind of supportedly on the, on the other's back. So I see this as, you have to do the hard thing, but I'll go with you. I'll go with you to your doctor's appointment. I'll go with you to meet with the chaplain to make the funeral arrangements. I will go with you to you know, look over the contract for that new house, whatever it is, I'll, I'll do it with you. So that kind of mutual aid and support. And then in the Six of Cups here, I like that we have two adults holding hands kind of running through a field. So it, it takes us away out of that nostalgia thing and brings us back more into this just concept of support, friendship, uh, being emotionally there for the other person, listening to them, you know, offering advice or help if they need it, but just but just being there, you know, sitting with someone. I've been trying to educate myself better about, you know, what to do for people who have a lot of anxiety. And a lot of times it is it is just sitting with them and being with them and saying, you know, I understand that you're having an anxious moment 
and everything's, you know, I don't know how everything's going to turn out, but I think it's going to be okay. And whatever does happen, I'm here for you. That's my thoughts on those sixes. And I have a couple more that I wanted to share. So here again, we have the six of pentacles from a couple different decks. And these kind of give a similar, a similar vibe to each other. So this is the six of pentacles from the fifth spirit tarot, and then the six of pentacles from the Maraloon tarot. And I like both of these better than the original image because there's a certain amount of ambig ambiguity here. Is this person with the outstretched hands, are they asking? Are they passing the plate and saying, hey, can you can contribute some money to this thing? And then this person saying, yes, I'll contribute and I'll put some in. Or is this person saying, oh, you need a little extra this week? Here, why don't you take some, take what you need. Uh, we're here for you, we've got your back, right? So I like that. And then I like, again, donations. Are you donating? Are you bringing toys and canned goods to the donations? Or do you need some help? Do you need to ask for some help? Do you need to go to the food shelf this week and pick up a few extra things so that you have enough to eat? So I really like both of these better than the original image. And I think they speak more clearly to that sense of equanimity, equanimity of give and take, take what you need, mutual aid. And then our last few here, um, I wanted to discuss these cards that again kind of reinforce that idea of community. So here we have the Six of Wands from the Maraloon, the Six of Air or Swords from the Gaian Tarot, and also the Six of Earth from the Gaian Tarot. Six of Wands and thinking about that community support, right? We didn't run in the race or we didn't do the thing, whatever it is that she's coming back from, but we're here to celebrate her. We're going to greet her with flowers. We're going to cheer her on. We're going to tell her how proud we are of her. Um, in this six of air, you have people doing some sort of outdoor exercise together, and it looks like it's got like a yoga, you know, meditation maybe component. These people, some of these people have their eyes closed. I don't know, singing a song together. I don't know what they're doing, but but they're doing it in community. Is my point. So so that sense of bonding, that sense of uplifting each other through doing something together in a group. Um, and then again, six of earth. You know, how can we best support each other and the earth? Well, we can go to the farmer's market and we can buy organic vegetables from small farmers that take good care of the land and are good stewards. Yeah. The sixes I have a lot of thoughts on, but um, they're some of my favorite cards in, in some of these other tarots. Not necessarily in the RWS, but in some of these other tarots, they're some of my favorite cards. So um, I hope that was sort of interesting and helpful. All right, we're going to move on to the sevens next. So for our sevens, of course, we start with the chariot as our trump. I typically read the chariot, I think, the way a lot of people do, as, you know, forward momentum, forward progress, taking matters into your own hands, making decisions, choosing a new direction, that kind of a thing. I suppose the other side of this could be something like, you know, being very egotistical in a situation, being heavy-handed or bombastic or demanding, um, that kind of thing, Using, trying to use your, like, personal will and force to get your way. Within the Golden Dawn keywords on our numbered cards for the suits, we have a, the usual jumble of keywords that don't really go together. On the cups, swords, and pentacles, we have illusionary success, unstable effort, and success unfulfilled. So three negative connotations, but we have valor for the wands, which is admirable, right? Um, making, a, making a good effort, um, trying your best. So I'm not really sure how those go together, but I can tie them together to each other and to the chariot by thinking about that idea of having learned a lesson and then applying that lesson. This card, for example, standing standing up for yourself, standing your ground when you're getting picked on, or you know, realizing in the, the Seven of Cups that you do have choices and that you can pick you can pick one of these. You have the ability, you have the privilege and the opportunity to choose something new. Here we have someone, and I think this card is often represented or interpreted as someone being sneaky. But if you look in the background, right, you've got these tents here, and then you have way back here, you have this little like dust cloud and this army approaching. So I see this guy not as being sneaky and thieving for a selfish or malicious purpose, but disarming the enemy, right? De-escalating the situation, um, using their their knowledge and expertise that they've gained to kind of change the, the outcome of the situation. Again, this guy, I don't know if he's frowning or not. I think he's just thinking. His mouth's slightly downturned, but I don't see him as being like sad or depressed. He's just kind of looking like, how's the crop coming along? Are these are these pentacles ready to harvest or not? You know, so having that sense of discernment 
and and trying to clearly you know clearly pick another direction do these things need more water do they need more fertilizer should i just let them grow and see how they go on their own you know what should be my next step and in that sense i think the star can kind of make sense with the chariot i mean i don't often think of these two cards together but if you think about chariot as the vehicle then the star is the gps you know it's it's the thing that's going to help you pick your next move or help guide you on your way as you're moving forward down the path and i and i get gps from tom benjamin i have to give him due credit because i heard that from him first um, he may have gotten it somewhere else but i heard it from him first and i've always liked that you know it's also interesting uh here that um in, in this depiction and in a lot of Marseille decks, historic Italian decks, she's usually clothed. It's a clothed woman, or it's just a picture of a star. There's no person. Um, but in most Marseille decks and modern tarots, it's a naked person. And so that's kind of interesting because by, by taking charge of a situation, you're, again, opening yourself up to vulnerability. You're opening yourself up to scrutiny. It's like, okay, you're the leader, so everyone's waiting for you to pick what we're going to do next. And if you fuck up, then, you know, you're going to look like an ass. So that's kind of the, the I guess, caveat emptor of the sevens generally, particularly of the chariot, but also of all of these. You know, you're, you're being called to make a decision about something, and are you going to pick the best pop possible option? Are you going to proceed in the more, most fortuitous manner? And looking at comparative imagery again, um, I didn't have a ton of, you know, wow examples from other decks for the, for the sevens, but I had a couple that were you know, interesting. Um, it may be a little difficult to see, but you can see this this character's face in profile, and she's looking up actively. She's going, hmm, um, like that. So, and looking at these cups, uh, and particularly this one up here. So it, it's interesting. It's 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 a little bit different than having the the figure in shadow where they're they're going like this. And I think a lot of people interpret the seven of cups as emotional overwhelm, which it could be. Um, I suppose if you're not ready to take the reins and kind of be in charge of the situation, it could be a little overwhelming. But here I see it more as, as discernment and picking something or trying to figure out something, trying to calculate uh, your next move. Same thing for the Seven of Swords. You know, this guy might look a little bit smug because he's kind of looking over his shoulder like, hmm. You know, I've, I've got all the swords. Um, but this character does not have that kind of expression. So she's more like looking behind, like, did anyone hear me? You know, am I going to get caught doing this? I've got to sneak out before I get caught. Um, but again, not being sneaky in a negative way, but kind of undermining authority because authority has become unjust. Um, because uh, there's some corruption or some problem here and things need to go in a different direction. And then the Seven of Earth, here she is either digging up or replanting a seedling. You know, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it could depend on the circumstance. But either way, trying to help out this, this little tree here that doesn't look so great, saying, okay, this is an invasive species. It needs to come out. I need to make this decision. Or, you know, this is a, an endangered species and I need to move it from this place where it's not getting a sun, enough sunlight and I need to replant it over here where it can hopefully have a better shot at survival. So some nice interpretations of the sevens. And so for me, the five, six, and seven really have an interlinked sense of fruition or, you know, progress. So I want to look at them together and explore that a little bit more. All right, so just to recap, right, we had the fours where everything was cozy and comfortable and safe and well supported and well balanced and all of that and then we get the fives uh, which kind of kick our ass you know they teach us a lesson they show us how uncoordinated we are uh, they make us think about kind of you know what we've lost more than what we've gained or they disrupt our thinking on something um, maybe they show how much of a jerk we've been being lately or they they make us worry about something they make us worry and fret potentially unnecessarily and so how do we get out of that five situation uh, we turn to the six we turn to each other we turn to the community and we know when we need to ask for help or we recognize that a friend is struggling and then we can offer them some help down here so we can 
you know, we can cheer them on, say, you know, yeah, that didn't go well last time, but you'll get it the next time around. Or, you know, here, here's some flowers to cheer you up. You've seemed kind of down in the dumps lately. Or, you know, let me let me help you uh, think that through a little bit more clearly now that now that it hasn't gone well the first time. Let me sit with you and, you know, maybe we can work on it together or you can bounce some ideas off me. Or, you know, hey, you got you got kicked out of your apartment. OK, you can stay with me for a couple of weeks until you find a new place to live. So that's just some examples of, of that. Um, and then in the seven, we can kind of apply this generosity to our life now that we're kind of more settled and less unstable uh, from the six experience, we can we can apply it in the seven and learn that lesson from the five. This up here, we were we were not um, doing well. We weren't we weren't coordinated in our efforts, but now this person is going to stand their ground against you know whatever they have to face. So they're not going to get blindsided by unexpected uncoordination so it's going to come together in such a way that they can face it here in the seven of cups uh, we go from a, a loss mentality to an abundance mentality we see oh you know well yes yeah, something disruptive did happen but i was reminded through the generosity of my friend that you know i still have plenty or um, i have other relationships that i can rely on even though i broke up with my boyfriend here again you know i got into that argument um, and it was the same old argument that I always have with that person and I realized I need to reconfigure my thinking about that so that next time that opportunity to argue comes up, I can kind of disengage um, or I can de-escalate or I can change the subject or whatever it is rather than having that same fight over and over again. And then here in the seven, all seemed lost, right? It seemed like it was going to be a terrible uh, a terrible year, or maybe last year was a terrible year, and I and I had to go through a lot of shit. Um, but through you know through community aid, through the generosity of whoever, you know I'm back on my feet now, and I know how to maybe take some steps to prevent this from being as bad the next time. You know all of our plans and all of our investments and things can be impacted by outside forces beyond our control, but we can be more resilient when those things happen. We can you know we can uh, rely on ourselves and make different kinds of plans and take different steps so that it's not as bad the next time. So that's kind of how I see the progression from the five through seven. And um, I just want to say again, thank you for uh, coming along this exploration with me. Um, I hope what I was trying to convey was clear. Um, but as always, it's not meant to be definitive. And I would love to kind of hear your observations too, if you read these numbers in a different way, or you have other insights um, and details that I didn't point out, let me know. And I will see you uh, for part four. If this is interesting, that'll be coming up next. Uh, be well, take care, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.